Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Uh, so I have a few more examples uh, today. Um, on uh, First of all, on Faraday's law. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a very classical example. We started with the example of a moving rod inside a magnetic field. So here I have extended this example a bit. And I have two rods that are moving within a constant magnetic field. And the question is to find the current uh, magnitude and direction that is flowing in this circuit. That is uh, flowing in the circuit. You see the, uh, the reason that we will have uh, electromotive force in this case is because the velocity of, uh, of the one rod is different from the velocity of the other rod. And therefore, this, uh, the, uh, the rod on the right goes with 40 centimeters per second, the rod on the left with 10 centimeters per second. So the area of this circuit is constantly expanding. So that is why we will have here time varying magnetic flux. So this uh, points really to Faraday's law. So I will apply Faraday's law on the circuit A, B, B prime, A prime. And uh, as always, I will have to define the direction that I trace the loop. So this is the loop. Let me just uh, plot it alone. Uh, let me trace it uh, in the clockwise direction. So if this is uh, my DL, I, have, I, I can conclude right away two things. First of all, that the EMF that I will compute acts as a virtual source that if it was positive, it would drive a current in the direction that I'm tracing the loop. So that will be the EMF that I will calculate from um, Faraday's law. And the second thing is that now the DS is given by the right hand rule and therefore points inwards. So ds points inwards. Uh, if you look at the coordinate system, x, y, z, uh, z points outwards. So the z axis points outwards. As you see, there is a magnetic field that is constant and points inwards. It's minus z hat 0.8 millitesla. So we have uh, then the flux through this circuit, which is a function of time, b dot ds. So the magnetic field is, let me write here, uh, 0.8 times 10 to minus 3 minus z hat. And then we have the ds. The ds, the way that we are tracing the loop, also points in the minus z direction, as you see. So it's minus z hat ds, uh, which is dx dy here in the loop. So minus z, that minus z gives me 1 plus 1. Then I have 0.8 times 10 to minus 3. And then this is the area of the loop. This is the area of the loop. And uh, the area of the loop is basically the difference between x2 and x1, that is the width, times the height, which is given to be 0.2 meters. So there is nothing, uh, not much to integrate here. Uh, again, I have the area of the loop. Which is x2 minus x1 times the height, uh, the height uh, is given 0.2 meters. So uh, 0.2 times 0.8 is 0.16, 10 to minus 3, x2 minus x1. Okay, so this is the flux. And then, uh, Faraday's law says that 
the EMF that I want to calculate is minus the time rate of change of this flux, minus d phi over dt. So I need to take uh, the derivative of this expression. You see I have the minus sign to uh, take care of. 0.16 times 10 to minus 3 is the constant. And then I have to take the derivative with respect to time of x2, the position of the second rod, minus x1, the position of the first, the first rod. Okay. And obviously these are the velocities of the two rods. So this one is the 40 centimeters per second, which is 0.4 and meters per second and this is the 10 centimeters per second or 0.1 meters per second. So this gives me 0.3. So I have all in all a current that is minus 0.48 milliamps. And the minus sign simply means that the current will be flowing in the opposite direction uh, that uh, I have assumed. Okay. So you see that uh, despite the fact that the um, area that is intercepting flux is constantly expanding, the rate remains the same, and therefore I have, as a result, a constant current that uh, flows through this circuit. Times, uh, millivolts, sorry. <laughs> I did millivolts. Millivolts. Me just... Uh, Any questions up to this point? Anything that I'm missing? Yeah. Uh, how did you identify the dx2 by dt? Is this just a change? You just found it a change? Yeah, so the length of this is x2 minus x1, as you see here. So the area is x2 minus x1 times the 0.2 meters. This is uh, the area that is intercepting the flux. The length is x2 minus x1, and then the height is 0.2 meters, right? So that is the current that we have, uh, the electromotive force. So now to find the current, because the uh, problem asks about the current, and that's why I also uh, rushed to give you the uh, millivolts, the milliamps. So uh, the EMF that I have computed acts as a source that looks like this. I'm being told that each rod has six ohms resistance. So we have six ohms here and six ohms here. And uh, that means that there is a current that in this direction will be EMF divided by 6 plus 6, the 12 uh, ohms, so minus 0.48 divided by uh, 12. Uh, so we have millivolts divided by uh, ohms, that is amps. And that gives you the minus 0 0.04 milliamps. Okay, so this is the current. So the next question, or any, any questions up to this point? So you see how this uh, formula works. You are finding the time varying flux. I could have used the V cross B dot DL as well, but uh, you see that this works very quickly. So you just find the, time, the, uh, the magnetic flux, and then you take the derivative and you are done. Yes? So I'm assuming 6 plus 6, you mean by the total resistance in the factory? 
That's right. That's ohm's law on this circuit. Ohm's law in this circuit. It's not parallel. It's in series. The six ohms coming. Yeah. It is in series. Yes. Because this is assumed direction. And then you see that the current is having a minus sign. So therefore, the actual current direction is the opposite. So the, uh, you see, I don't have to worry about, I assume whatever direction I want. The assumed current direction will always be in the direction that I trace the loop. OK, so this is the i. And then, like you say, you expect to be in the opposite direction. That is indicated by the sign. So I don't have to worry with assuming ahead of time where the current will flow. So I have the reference direction, which is the direction that I'm tracing the loop, and then the sign tells me if the actual current will flow in that direction or the other direction. So to answer then the actual current direction, So the minus sign indicates that the actual current direction is opposite to the one that we assumed. So the actual current direction is like this. And the follow-up question to this is that confirm that the current direction So the direction of the induced current is consistent with Lenz's law. So that is the follow-up question. Confirm that this is consistent with Lenz's law. So you see the induced current produces its own magnetic flux. Uh, so the magnetic flux will be of the produced by the induced current will be like this. So why is this consistent with Lenz's law? Any ideas? Yeah. Go ahead. So it opposes the change in the opposes the change because here in this case because the right rod moves faster than the left rod what happens is that the flux through the circuit always is increasing it always increases uh, the uh, time rate of change of the flux is always positive in fact you can see that here as well x2 is greater than x1 d5 by dt is always positive it's not oscillating yes please So I is not increasing because the rate of change of the flux is constant. So you are right that the flux constantly increases, however, at the same rate. And that's why the current remains constant. Uh, so confirm that the direction of the induced current is consistent with Lenz's law here because um, the rate of change of the flux is always positive. The induced magnetic field opposes the external magnetic field. And indeed, we see that with the current that we have found because the external field points inwards and the induced field points outwards. So indeed, here we have confirmation of Lenz's law as we should have. So opposes the external flux. Okay, so this is, this is it. Uh, there is uh, another question. This is from a, a past exam. Uh, I hope uh, this next question is very easy. And it is whether there is any torque on the circuit. I don't know if anybody remembers 
uh, torque. So now that I have this loop and there is current flow, the circuit behaves as a magnetic dipole with a magnetic dipole moment that is equal to the current times the area. Remember how the magnetic dipole is uh, defined, the magnetic dipole moment is defined and it points in the direction outwards, so it is z hat. So will there be any torque on the circuit? In other words, will the, that magnetic field try to turn the circuit around? So remember from magnetic materials, these torques are applied in order to align the magnetic dipole moment with the external magnetic field, either align or totally misaligned to 180 degrees. In fact, torque is M cross B. And uh, this is uh, one of the important phenomena in magnetism because it underpins the magnetic properties of materials. So here, the magnetic dipole moment is in the Z direction. The magnetic field is in the minus Z direction, so this cross product is zero. There is no torque. The magnetic field, the magnetic dipole moment of this loop is already aligned with, in fact, a 180 degrees. It's anti-parallel to the external magnetic field, so therefore there is no torque here. So this is a classical example that uh, in uh, Faraday's law. Yes, please. I didn't understand the part where you consider the thing as a dipole moment. Which, which part are we considering here? Is a so the magnetic dipole is generally a loop of area S that defines area S and there is current I along the loop. That's a general de the general definition that we had seen back in uh, the beginning of magnetism. And we assign a magnetic dipole moment pointing in this direction with a magnitude current times area and points in the direction normal to the loop. So now that I have a loop, I can assign to it a magnetic dipole moment. Whenever you give me a circuit, I can assign to it a magnetic dipole moment. It's going out of the loop. Yes, it's always pointing outwards. Yes, please. So it's always normal to the surface. Yes, okay. yes. That's the definition of a magnetic dipole moment. And uh, the fundamental phenomenon that we owe magnets to is that uh, whenever you bring in a magnetic dipole, and we know that uh, in natural media magnetic dipoles are formed due to the orbital and spin motion of electrons. Whenever you bring in magnetic dipoles inside the magnetic field, then the magnetic field will apply a torque trying to align to make those magnetic dipole moments either parallel or anti-parallel to the field. There are those two states. Uh, I think it's first, yes. I just wonder if you could provide like, a situation where they wouldn't be like, aligned with like, the magnetic dipole and the... Yes, you can refer to an example that we had done in class where we had uh, uh, a loop that was like this and then the magnetic field that was running like this. So in this case, we had a torque uh, in fact, I uh, tend to remember that I saw this example in this very room that uh, would uh, turn the, the loop uh, in order to align the magnetic um, dipole moment to the external field. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is uh, the example. Let me just add one more question that, that wasn't in that exam. Um, how much would be the current if the magnetic, if the magnetic field was time varying? So let's say that we don't have a 0.8 millitesla, we have a cosine omega t, something like this. Okay, since your classmate asked about time varying currents. So how do I do this calculation? So in this case, the flux here becomes B of t, so the only thing that changes here is that I have to replace the 0.8 millitesla with some cosine, that B of t. So then I have H, x2 minus x1. Okay, so this will be the flux. And now, if I 
find the time rate of change I have two terms. I have the transformer EMF, which comes from the first term. So you see I have to apply the chain rule because I have time dependence here, time dependence there. So I first apply uh, the derivative on the magnetic field. So this is the transformer EMF. And then I have the second term, which will be the same as the one that we saw before. So it will be B of t times h v2 minus v1. So the difference in the velocities. And that will be the motional EMF, which is what we just calculated. So the EMF we just found was motional, because if the rods were not moving in the magnetic field, there would not be any, any current, anything interesting in this situation. So this is the one that we had. This is the one that um, now appears if I have a time varying magnetic field. So you see that uh, by using this approach of finding the flux through the circuit and then taking the derivative, uh, things are fairly uniform uh, even if you have time varying field or no time varying field. And then obviously here you have a, a, a time varying current as well that comes from this uh, dB over dt, which will be minus omega sine omega t. Okay, so then you will have the constant current coming from the motional term and a sinusoidally varying current that comes from the transformer term. So this is one of the cases where it's both, right? It's transformer as well as it's motional. That's right. It's composite. All right. Um, so to introduce the next uh, example, which will be a calculation of uh, a mutual inductance. I will do a small demonstration. Uh, so my second example. Mutual inductance between a solenoid and a loop. So the solenoid is along the z axis. Uh, you, uh, we don't have to worry about the uh, length of the solenoid. It has n turns per unit length. Current I. And let's say the current flows in uh, this direction so that it gives you a nice magnetic field that points in the z direction. And where is the loop that we want to calculate the uh, uh, mutual inductance? That is also on the xy plane, so it is a loop like this. Of radius b. Okay. And uh, the uh, solenoid has radius here a. So to see the cross-section of this uh, structure, we have the solenoid here. This is uh, the z-axis. Uh, the currents are flowing on the solenoid like this. And we have the loop outside. Let me use a different color. So the solenoid has radius A, radius A, and there is the loop outside that has radius B. Okay, and I want to find the mutual inductance. Uh, let's say also that uh, the core of the solenoid uh, has magnetic permeability 
меню. So this is uh, here a solenoid. Uh, you can see it, I hope. And this is a core. And um, I will be uh, feeding the solenoid with a current. And this is a copper ring. What I expect to happen, first of all, with the solenoid, we have uh, seen from Ampere's law that the magnetic flux density is in the z direction mu n times i. So there is a very simple relation between the magnetic field within the solenoid, which if we consider it to be infinitely long, it is uniform, per permeability of the core times uh, turns per unit length times current. As we uh, mentioned in transformers, we use uh, ferromagnetic cores like this one to concentrate the magnetic flux. So the magnetic flux is actually created. Uh, I am um, right now uh, constrained by uh, these wires. Maybe I will just for a moment. Unplug it. I unplugged more than I wanted to unplug. Just come back here. Okay, so uh, this is the solenoid and this is the core. The solenoid will produce the magnetic field and then the core will concentrate it above. Okay, so the other thing that we know, I will feed an AC current and therefore we know that time very magnetic field by Faraday's law will create circulating electric field. Faraday's law tells us that magnetic field, time varying magnetic flux, produces electric field just in the same way that currents produce magnetic field. So therefore there will be a circulating electric field and that circulating electric field will be uh, induced also within this copper loop which has conductivity sigma and therefore it will induce currents. And uh, those currents Now, uh, now are producing this levitation effect that you are seeing. This levitation effect that you are seeing and the copper loop is levitating. This is clearly due to the eddy currents and there is a very easy way to demonstrate this just like in our previous uh, demonstration. First of all, if you touch it, it's already hot uh, because the ohmic power, not very hot, won't, won't burn you, you can keep, you can touch. So because the ohmic power is transformed to heat. Uh, so if we, instead of uh, a uniform copper ring, we have a ring that is cut in the middle. So it has a similar cut with the cut that I had in the uh, copper cylinder in the um, effect of magnetic breaking that I demonstrated on Monday. So if we do this and I repeat the experiment, nothing happens now. Really nothing happens. On the other hand, if, uh, my, if I use an aluminum uh, now uh, cylinder, the conductivity is stronger and therefore the current is stronger. and the ring uh, jumps higher. So you see how uh, we have here at once multiple effects that we have seen in the course. The field of the solenoid, one. Second, we have the, this magnetic core that is, uh, the role of it is to actually concentrate the flux. And I will pass it around because when I talked about magnetic cores, I told you that because of the eddy currents, because of the eddy currents, we have dissipation, power dissipation in the core. But the core here is actually cool. You can confirm it. Yeah. There is, it's not hot at all. 
Why? Because you will see that it has been made out of small cylinders that are there to actually uh, introduce air pockets within the cross-section of the core that cut off the eddy currents. And therefore, they are reducing. It's a very uh, nice practical trick. I'll pass it around so you can see it, so you can circulate it. It's a nice trick to actually uh, short, open circuit, sorry, the eddy currents uh, so that they don't uh, dissipate power in the core and they don't heat up the core. That's a very uh, simple trick to protect, actually, uh, the, the magnetic core. And we have the eddy currents and we see the forces because it is the repulsive force between the current on the loop and the current on the solenoid that is producing this effect of the jumping ring that we saw. So, obviously, there is a coupling between the ring here and the solenoid that can be estimated from mutual inductance. When we introduce mutual inductance, it might have not been clear why do we care about it at all. Right? Now we know why we, why we care about it. Because flux is inductance times current. So that mutual inductance between the solenoid and the loop, L21 or L12, whichever way you want to call it, represents the strength with which the solenoid will induce flux onto the loop. And why do we care about it? Because time-varying flux by Faraday's law introduces electromotive force and current. So this is really uh, the uh, physical meaning of the inductance. So inductance is flux through the loop. due to the solenoid divided by the current of the solenoid. So how much is the flux through the loop? You see the loop here, the red loop, is intercepting flux only through this area. So it doesn't matter how big the loop is, it still uh, intercepts flux through the same area. Why? Because this is produced by the solenoid and it's concentrated by the core and therefore the flux only exists in this inner area. So this is quite an important point. You may start increasing your loop as much as you like, but actually the flux is intercepted only by the small area. So the EMF, that would have been a trick question. I think we gave you something similar in the quizzes. So the EMF would be the same if you have this loop or you have this loop or you have this loop. The reason being that uh, you have the same flux. And the flux is B dot DS. You see we have constant magnetic flux from the solenoid M mu n times i times pi a squared. So still this L21 is phi by i, which is mu n pi a squared. So same as the self-inductance of the solenoid. So that is uh, the mutual inductance uh, question. Uh, the important part is you see that it is independent of the radius of the loop. So in this case, it's independent of the radius of the loop. When would it be dependent on the radius of the loop? Yes? If some way the, the flux could have escaped the solenoid if there was a gap or something. 
Right, so I, I'm not sure I, I, and I uh, will say the same thing, but this is uh, anyway the answer to this question, which is that if the loop was inside the solenoid, so if I had this situation now, and B was, B was less than A, so I had this uh, small loop inside here, then I would intercept flux through this area. So in that case, phi would be, if this would be B, phi would be mu n i pi b squared, and then the mutual inductance would be uh, mu n pi b squared. So we have uh, the situation where we are outside, no matter how big is the loop, you have the same effect. Um, if it is inside, obviously, it depends on the radius of the loop. Yes? Uh, so I'm just confused to why, like why is um, magnetic field lines, why don't they exist outside of the solenoid? So here I have considered a solenoid that is infinitely long and therefore concentrated in a straight line very similar to uh, the core that you're holding that concentrates the magnetic flux lines and then I put a ring on top. So yes, the magnetic flux lines uh, fringe uh, over the core, but where the loop is, uh, the loop is sampling a uniform magnetic field and therefore uh, it shows what you just saw, the induction of the current and so on, yeah. Could it ever be possible to have a very but that's exactly what we had right now. I fed the solenoid with, uh, oh, you mean in space or in time? In time. In time, I had it in time right here. So if the current is time varying, if the current is time varying, then you have uh, time varying magnetic flux. Oh, so if it was uniform, the current could, it could have no... So this is uniform in space, they are uniform magnetic field lines, but this current, just like in my demonstration, is time varying. I fed an AC current. Sorry, yes. I just wanted to ask how you got the equation for the field of a solenoid. Uh, that one I had uh, shown back in Ampere's law. So, uh, you want me to uh, do Ampere's law in the solenoid? It is, uh, so we, we basically uh, take the cross, at the time we took the cross section of the solenoid. So we see the wires coming out from here and then we see the wires coming into here. And we applied Ampere's law after arguing from Biot-Savart that the magnetic field necessarily has to be in the z direction. So then once you establish this, then you can do uh, Ampere's law on a length L like this. And then you have uh, B times L equals to enclosed uh, current, uh, mu times enclosed current. How much is the enclosed current? Is turns per unit length times length times current. So then the L cancels out and you have uh, mu times uh, turns per unit length times the current. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so let me then uh, very quickly, since we are in time varying stuff, um, give you one more example now on the displacement current. Okay, so we have uh, here a capacitor.
So it's a parallel plate capacitor, the example that we um, used to present the displacement current. Time varying voltage feeds the capacitor. So the voltage is time varying. And inside the capacitor, we have a material, a dielectric material. with permittivity epsilon and conductivity sigma. So we have, uh, if this is uh, the z axis, we have an electric field that is minus Vc over H, the separation between the plates in the z direction, minus z direction. And uh, we're being told that in between the plates, the material has permittivity epsilon and conductivity sigma. And the question is, is there conduction or displacement current or both within the capacitor? So this is the question. Is there displacement current and is there conduction current within the capacitor? Any ideas? Yes. Both. So this is a case where we have both. We have displacement current because you, all you need for displacement current is time varying magnetic electric field. All you need for displacement current is time varying electric field. So you have displacement current right here where I stand. There is displacement current density because the access point of the wireless network, the radio transmitters, the cellular communication systems are sending electric fields that are time varying. Once you have that, you don't need a wire. And that is the foundational principle of wireless communications. I don't need a wire to transmit a signal. A time varying electric field can do that. Uh, so therefore, I have displacement current. And that displacement current is given by this formula, d over dt, d dot ds. So that will be times the area of the plates, let me call it A. So that will be epsilon A over H, dV of the uh, capacitor by dt. So this is the current of the uh, capacitor. You see this is the capacitance, C. And there will be conduction current as well and uh, we have conduction current because now we've been told that there is conductivity. So there is conduction current due to the conductivity and that conduction current density to begin with is sigma E. That was the field form of Ampere's law. So it's sigma Vc over H Z hat. So there is current flowing down the cross section. I can calculate that current by integrating on the cross section that will be sigma Vc over H times the area. In fact, you can see this as Vc divided by H sigma A. And this is now the resistance of this parallel plate system because a regular resistor you know has resistance if this is uh, length L cross section A the resistance that you have seen probably since school 
is length divided by conductivity times area. Well, guess what? Now the current flow uh, evolves in the vertical direction. So the length of the flow is the separation between the plates, H. The area of the flow is the cross-section of the capacitor. And sigma is the conductivity of the dielectric in between. So here you have a physical realization of the capacitor. And Amp Amper Maxwell law tells us that H dot DL will be I of the, uh, the displacement current plus the conduction current. And we have those two terms that you see over there. So based on these two terms, can we find an equivalent circuit for this parallel plate system? Which one? Yes. We can, we can calculate the resistance here as, as you already gave the formula for. I have the resistance, I have the capacitance. So what is the equivalent circuit of this? It's an RC circuit. It's an RC circuit. So are they parallel or uh, in series, the two elements? Because the current is splitting the half. So Not in half. There are those two terms. So it is in parallel because you see that the voltage is the same that is uh, seen by both elements. So if you look at the current, the displacement current, C dVc by dt. So the voltage that it sees is this V sub C. And then the same voltage is seen by the conduction current when you derive here the law. And we derived it again from fields. We didn't apply, this is derivation of your circuit equations from first principles, really. Um, so we derived uh, the equation was V over R, and then the same V appears. If the same voltages appear there, that means that the two elements are in parallel, and this is the equivalent circuit. And we have uh, H over sigma A, the resistance here, and epsilon A over H, the capacitance there. Okay. Yes. One question. When you were uh, gathering the value of the current in series, right? Why is, why is the value negative? Is this because of minus epsilon? Because it uh, flows downwards. And then to find the current that flows the downward direction, you have to integrate over a DS that also points downwards. So J dot DS ends up being positive. So I find the current, right? I have to integrate. Uh, over the cross section in the direction that the current flows. So the current can never come ne out ne the, in this situation where you have the J and you find the current, then uh, I calculate it in the direction that the current flows. So I know where the current flows and then I do the direction. It's uh, different from the EMF where I don't assume, I don't know where the current actually flows. So here I knew the direction and I integrated in that direction. Okay, uh, so that's it for today. I'll continue tomorrow with uh, more examples. Thanks for your attention.